Good morning, Mount Movers Church. Good morning to those of you guys that are watching online this morning. We are really um, excited to be in this series. Uh, we hope you caught last week's service. If you did not, please go back because there is way too much ground for us to cover. There's no, there's not nearly the time that we need to be able to cover uh, the material to get you caught up. So if you did not catch last week's message, there's really a lot of groundwork. Uh, this 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 whole series is pretty sequential. You really kind of need to understand what happens every week because we're building on previous lessons. So make sure you go back and see that and the last week's message. The easiest way for you to get caught up is grab the app. All right, they're always on there. By tonight, it'll be on there. It'll be ready for you to grab it. So make sure you just download the app. You can get it. That That's way. right. And while you're on your phone, go ahead and share hope. You can do that through the Facebook Live experience. Please, please, please. Take advantage of the opportunity of technology. This is not just a typical announcement. This is your opportunity to reach out to somebody that you know or somebody that you're friends with on social that needs hope. Listen, guys, this life is but a vapor. It's here and it's gone. Heaven is my home. I hope you've made it your home, but there's people you know that have not. And you have the power, the opportunity to just hit share. And if you will please, please do that. This is not about Mount Movers Church. This is not about Brad and Misty. This is about propelling the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that we know and those we love and those we care about. So please do that today. Share hope. Okay, we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, last week, I have a true confession. Second, sir, it's not funny. Second service, okay, we went over on first service. Like we went over, over pretty bad. On first service but then second service rolls around and when misty gets done it's noon and i'm like okay cool because like we went from four services in the old building to two services in this building. we've changed our service time so many times i don't even know what time it is i don't know how many services we're doing i don't know what time services get out so it's noon she wraps up her part so i'm thinking sweet i got 30 minutes and service gets out at noon all right normally so i taught for 30 minutes <laughs> second service last week and we got done i'm like misty hey babe right back here fist bump Woo. right on time she said you were 30 minutes over <laughs> idiot i did not say it like that might as well your eyebrows said i did it. not <laughs> husbands your wives you idiot. bye guys so today we're seriously going to cover a lot of ground and we're probably going to go over just a few minutes so i'm just going to give you a heads up but here's my promise to you we have some incredible, uh, intriguing material to share with you. I am hoping to God that you are sincerely taking notes because you're not going to remember what we're going to share with you right now. Uh, but if you will go over it later and really research what we're saying, don't take everything that we say to the bank. Test it against the Word of God. Study it and see for yourself that what we're saying is true because the Word of God is true from cover to cover. Okay? So let's do this. We are in a series. It is entitled, Ready for Anything. Today is part two, and we are going to be covering a topic called the rapture. The title of today's message is Rapture Ready. We're going to be answering two questions. I'll get to those questions here in just a moment. But I want to start with this. Prayer. Let's do that. I was going to tell a story, but I, we need to pray this morning because there are people that uh, the enemy uh, will fight tooth and nail to distract you and cause you to think that what you're about to hear isn't important. And I'm telling you, this may be the most important message you've ever heard in your entire life. So please, please, please take very seriously what we're about to share with you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would open every ear to hear what your word says. I pray that we would hear the whisper of your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts sincerely in a real way. Speak to us today, God, and, and, and let us take what you show us and run with it and change our hearts and our lives to glorify and to please you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said? All right. So uh, today, uh, I, want to, um, I want to start with this. How many of you guys have ever missed a flight before? Have you ever missed a flight? Raise your hand if you've ever missed a flight. Okay. How many of you guys know, how many of you guys have ever been on a flight? Show me your hands. Okay, there we go. All right. So how many of you know it's really important to get there early, right? Like sometimes a couple hours early, depending on what city you're in. But at minimum, you need to be an hour early because you need to have all, all your T's crossed, all your I's dotted. You got to have everything in order. You got to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. Or else, guess what? Is, is the pilot waiting on you? 
is the plane going to just sit there and just wait for you to come running down the listen if you're if you're not there when you're supposed to be there if you're not ready say ready, ready. if you're not ready when that plane takes off you are going to miss your flight and that is the essence of what the rapture is to the church if you're not ready say ready, ready. if you're not ready when Jesus comes back you are going to miss your flight and as pastors, our hearts are broken. We are highly motivated to teach the unfailing word of God and its truth so that you will know what his word says. You will understand the promises of God, the timing of God, the, the seasons and the signs of our time. So you'll be ready when Jesus returns because we believe very firmly that Jesus is going to return very soon to rapture his church. And the question is, are you ready and are, hel are you helping those that are in your circle of influence to be ready as well? So in today's message, let's show this timeline. I'm sorry. I'm kind of squirrel pastor today because there's so much content. But I, I want, if you don't understand this timeline, a lot of what we're sharing with you isn't going to make any sense. And we're going to refer to this quite a bit through this entire series. All right. So, so this is a snapshot of where we're at right now in time to how the Bible describes time will roll out until the eternal age, which you can see on the far right. So very quickly, in this green section, we are living in the church age, and Misty and I believe we are right on that blue-green line, literally, where we believe Jesus could come any moment. We're going to show you in today's message and next week's message, we're going to show you why we believe that. So we believe the next event to take place will be the rapture of the church where Jesus will take us all up into the clouds, receive us to himself, and take us to heaven, at which point we will enter into a, a seven-year season called the marriage supper of the Lamb. We don't have that on this because we didn't want to cobble up this timeline so much, but we're going to refer to the marriage supper of the Lamb here in just a moment. But no, for those seven years, what is titled as the seven years of tribulation on this timeline for believers, those who have received Christ and have a real relationship with him, not religion, but relationship, we will be with him for seven years in heaven while here on earth, the great tribulation will be taking place. Seven years, okay? The rise of the Antichrist takes place, one world government, hell on earth. You don't want to be here. That's why we're preaching this sermon and this series. After that will be the second coming of Christ, which a lot of people, when they're reading scriptures... And it's an honest mistake because I myself have to know, okay, what, what am I reading? What account am I reading? There are two raptures that will take place. There's the first rapture, the rapture of the church, and then his second coming. There's scriptures where you can be reading in Revelation and read about this experience where Jesus is returning, but it's talking about the second coming of Christ, not the first. So we believe the second coming will happen. Jesus will come back, kick butt and take names. That's not the nice Jesus. This is the wrath of God Jesus that you don't want to meet. Then there will be, the, you guys heard of the Battle of Armageddon? That will take place at the second coming of Christ, the Megiddo Valley and Israel, blood up to the bridles of horses. The, then after we kick butt and take names, then the millennial reign, 1,000 years here on earth with Jesus, ruling the earth, 1,000-year millennial reign. Satan, it's not on here, but Satan will be released one more time to tempt and to try to take over, take control. God's going to kick his butt again. Then he's going to throw him into the eternal lake of fire. And then will be the final judgment where God, this will be like no more grace. During the, right now in the church age, you can come to Christ and say, God, forgive me of my sins. That's why we do this at the end of every message. We give you an opportunity to, to call out to God and ask for forgiveness of your sins and, and make Jesus Lord of your life and invite him into your heart to live for him because we are in the age of grace where you can do that. But there will be a time where you will not be able to do that, and that is at the final judgment. It'll be too late. Like flight, really, really, really missed. You're going to miss it altogether, okay? During the seven years of, tri of grace, of the severe age of grace, you will be able to come to Christ, but... It's not going to be good. You'll have to lose your head for that to happen. We'll talk more about that. The final judgment happens, and then we move into the eternal age of grace where that goes on forever and ever and ever, where Jesus brings heaven literally down to earth. He makes it the way that he intended in the Garden of Eden. Okay? So today on part two, title of this message, if you're taking notes, and I'm a note taker, so I'm going to make sure you know, it's called Rapture Ready. We're going to cover two questions, and I'm just going to preface with this. We're probably going to cover one, okay? Because <laughs> I know how many pages of notes we have, so I'm just telling you ahead of time. We're probably going to cover one, 
Because I also, I, I, I know this. As bad as Brad and I are all about timelines and calendars and when we decide how long we want the series to go, we are all about being done with that series by that time. But here's what I feel like is happening. This is new information for a lot of people. It's overwhelming and I don't want to throw so much on you that you can't obtain any of it, okay? And so we'll probably just cover one. We'll see how far we get. So I'm just gonna make this disclaimer. We're gonna go as far as we can go till you look like you're glazing over and then we're just gonna shut it down, all right? And we'll pick it back up next week. This series may end up being a little longer than normal. But the very first question we're gonna cover today is this. What is the rapture of the church? For some of you sitting in this room today, you may have never heard of the rapture. Others of you, you've heard it, but it's been what's been taught to you. Maybe you've never studied it. We are going to take you all over the Word of God, and we're going to show you from Old Testament to New to the book of Revelation in the very end where this is laid out, exactly what it is, all right, and why you don't want to miss it. Question number two we're going to cover if we get to it today, if not, we'll hold it till next week, is why does there even need to be a rapture? Now, disclaimer, when you talk about the rapture of the church, there is different theories, okay, as you study the word of God, there are different beliefs. Some people believe pre-tribulation, that is what we believe. We believe that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation, and we're going to show you why, all right? We're going to show you in this week and next why we personally believe that. However, some people will tell you, no, 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 no. You're so wrong. It's mid-trib. It's in the middle of that, tri that timeline, that tribulation. Others will say, nope, it's at the end. Now listen to me. This is nothing to split hairs over. It is not your salvation, all right? We, if you told me, you know what, I do not believe that you have to invite Jesus in your heart to go to heaven, I would say we have a problem, okay? You are wrong. I am right. In this case, there are, people have studied it forever, okay? And only God himself knows. But I truly believe with all of my heart we're going out of here before the tribulation. And that is why our hearts are so heavy that you get this and you understand. Because even I have four teenagers, okay? If you've ever raised teenagers, you know there's days you don't think they're saved, okay? And I mean, I'm like praying over my kids, God, please help them to get it. Because I do not want anybody I know to be here during the tribulation. It's going to be hell on earth. So here we go. I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 13, and this is the classic passage of Scripture. You've probably heard read at a funeral. Every funeral we preach, gravesides, you're going to hear this passage because this brings hope. This brings comfort. Listen to this. But I do not want you to be ignorant. Say ignorant. Listen to me. The reason God laid all of this out, and we talked about this last week, is he did not want his people, he did not want his children to be ignorant of what was getting ready to happen. So he says, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who've fallen asleep, those who have died, okay? Those who are resting. Lest sorrow as others who have no hope. Four, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. I'm going to pause right there. What this is saying is that there is a generation that will be alive when Christ returns. And we fully believe we are that generation. Now, I mean, I could, I could leave here today and get hit by a car and you could never see me again. But I truly believe the generation that is living today, whoever is still alive in this generation, you're going to see the coming of Christ. Verse 16. For the Lord himself, he will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ, they will rise out of their graves. Get this picture in your head. They will rise out of their graves first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Say caught up. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort. Say comfort. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We get the word rapture from that two-word combination, caught up. Throughout the Bible, you're not going to see the actual word rapture anywhere in any translation. But when you study this out, the actual word, I think they've got it up there for you, in the Latin it is rapturo, and in Greek it's herpazo. But it literally means this, to seize, to snatch away, to be carried from one place to another. That's where we get this word rapture, the rapture of the church. And listen, this is not actually anything new that has never happened before. 
You're like, what? There's actually six other times that it's notated with this exact same word, caught up, okay, or raptured, six other times. I do not have time to go through all of these. Some of these, you guys are like, I've heard of these people. Others, you might want to just snap a picture, write it down, but I'm going to give you these six. First one is this, Enoch. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24 that Enoch was not. God literally just took him. Enoch did not die. Okay, he was raptured. Elijah, 2 Kings 2, 1 and 2, it says that he was taken up in a whirlwind. Isaiah, Isaiah 6, 1 through 3, Jesus himself was taken up in the clouds in Acts 1 and 9. Philip was literally snatched away. He was literally caught up from one place, taken 20 miles, and set down because God wanted him to share the gospel with someone else. And the sixth one is Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. You guys can study those on your own, all right? But in the same way that this six times in previous history, from Old Testament to New, there was a generation of people that are going to be raptured just like they were, but this time it will not just be one. It will be a group. It will be the body of Christ, all right? I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to tell you exactly how this is going to happen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 53, and it says this. Behold, I tell you a mystery. How many would agree this is a bit of a mystery? <laughs> you go to study, and it, it, is, it is mysterious. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die is what that means. But we shall all be changed in a moment. Say moment. In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. That word moment tells us how long we have to get ready when it happens. That word is atomos. It's where we get the word atomic from, all right? It literally means a millisecond. Now count with me. We're going to count a second, okay? One, two. A millisecond is one millionth of what I just counted. One millionth of a second. So you say to yourself, so when the trumpet sounds and we hear it, do I have time in that moment to say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of all my sins and all the things that I've done that did not please you? No. It's over. You missed your flight. None. Done. The rapture of the church happens so fast in one, one millionth of a second, and we are gone. The dead will raise out of the graves. They will go into the clouds. Those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up, it says, to be seized up. We'll meet Jesus together, and where does it happen? literally in the clouds where the vultures are at you can read other passages i didn't have time to throw them all in here carol was already telling me shut it down you got 70 passages <laughs> so i couldn't throw it in there but we're gonna meet him he's not gonna come jesus isn't gonna come stand on the earth we're gonna be caught up in the air in just a moment it is so desperately important guys that you get this that you are ready i believe with all of my heart that the enemy's got one mission right now he wants to distort, and he wants to distract. He wants to distort, and he wants to distract right now. Because he knows, listen, those who are non-believers, they're going to miss it already, okay? If you don't know Jesus, if you're not living for Jesus, if you don't have him in your heart, you're not going in the rapture, okay? But there are believers who are still in churches. There are people who are walking through church doors week in and week out. And I believe wholeheartedly, and we're going to show you a passage in Matthew at the end of this message today, a lot of people, when the rapture happens, are still going to be sitting in their seats in the church. And I don't say that to be, like, hurtful. I don't say that to be ugly. Here's what I know. When I read the word, it's very, very clear that Jesus is coming for a pure and spotless bride who is ready, who is not asleep. I don't know any bride if her wedding was at 2 o'clock, that she didn't start at 6 a.m. getting ready. Anybody know any brides around here? Any girls getting ready to get married? I know a few. Any bridezillas in the house? When, when it comes time for a wedding, everybody is hands on deck. I mean, we got somebody doing the makeup, somebody doing the hair, somebody getting the shoes on, the dress on. We got four girls buttoning that sucker They're up. They're getting ready. Tightening everything down <laughs> so that she is perfect when she walks down that aisle. 
Jesus is coming back for a church. He's coming back for a bride that is pure and spotless, that is ready, ready that go. has not been distracted by the enemy. Because listen, the enemy wants you to get your eyes on yourself and your own circumstances and all the things of this world that the Bible says very clearly, they're staying here when we leave. The awesome Jeep I drive, kidding, if you know what car I drive, is staying here when I go. The money in my bank account is staying here when I go. You've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it because you don't take the possessions that you acquire on this earth when you go. We are out of here. Everything is over in that moment, and you're not going to have any regrets if you make that trip right. because heaven is beyond your imagination. Yeah. Job said, naked I came into this life, and naked I'll go. We're not going to be able to take anything with us. And I think that's why the Lord pressed upon my heart this morning as I was praying for you that we should ask ourselves the question, if, if I were to make my main objective in life to please God, how would that change things? Because the reality is, guys, we so easily slip into this mode and into this zone of living life to please ourselves. It's not that God's a killjoy. It's not that he doesn't want you to enjoy his blessings. He does. He wants you to be able to vacation and have a nice home and a nice car and a career. Those things are just fine. But the fact is we put those things first and make those things a priority rather than making pleasing God our priority. Because when we get things right, everything falls into place. And our hope and our heart as your pastors is to get you right before God, to get your head and your heart right before God so that you'll be ready for his soon coming return. So here's a question for you. What will life look like when Jesus returns? What will life look like when he raptures us? We're, we're answering, this is kind of like a sub-question to a question, what is the rapture? Well, what will life look like when the rapture happens? Let me give you an example here in Luke 17, verses 26 through 30, and then we're going to skip to 34 through 37. Jesus was explaining what it's going to be like when he returns, and he said in verse 26, chapter 17 of Luke, he says, when the Son of Man, that's himself, when Jesus returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. All right, so that makes you ask the question, what was it like in Noah's day? Right before uh, God shut the door to the ark, what was life like when Noah was building the ark? If you know the backstory, life was pretty normal for everybody, all right? In those days, verse 27, the Bible, uh, the people, I'm sorry, enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat and the flood came and destroyed them all. All right, so would you agree that in Noah's day, when the wrath of God came in the form of a flood, would you agree by this text that life for everybody else was normal, right? They were doing business as usual. So let's skip to verse 28 and see what life was like. And the world will be as it was also in the days of Lot. There's another story. Right around the time of Abraham, people went about their daily business. They were eating. They were drinking. They were buying and selling, farming and building until the morning Lot left Sodom. Then here's what happened. Fire and burning sulfur rained down. We're talking about the wrath and the judgment of God on a city that was far, far, far from God. All right? God judges this city, but what happens? Lot has to leave first, but life was normal. Yes, it will be, verse 30, business as usual right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So what Jesus is saying very clearly is that when he returns, can you throw up that timeline again real quick? If what your pastors believe is true, and that is that the rapture of the church is the next event to happen, then that means when he comes... Life, daily life for you and I will be business as usual, as usual. People will be getting married. They'll be eating and drinking and going to work and doing what people do. Uh, so, so I want you to get this picture in your head. Life with business as usual. Okay, this is not the picture that you see when you read up on the seven years of tribulation. Seven years of tribulation will be the wrath of God. It will be hell on earth. It will be judgment. It will be the most awful circumstances you can possibly imagine. That's why you don't want to be here. But I can tell you what it won't be. It's not going to be business as usual. People are not going to be eating and drinking and laughing and going to work and doing what they do day in and day out because 
it's going to be absolutely horrible. The earth is going to be a mass wreck, okay? So here we see in this passage, this picture, life, business as usual. Now, notice in, uh, I want you to notice in verse 35, okay, it talks about um, uh, women. Did I read that yet? No, I'm sorry. Let me, I'm sorry. Let me skip back. Verse 34, it says, that night two people will be asleep in a bed. This is more examples. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour together at the mill. One will be taken, another will be left. Where Will this happen, Lord? The disciples asked, and Jesus said, Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so their signs indicate that the end is near. The words I want you to take notice of, or the word mentioned twice, is taken, all right? That word taken. Jesus is saying, I will take you, I will help you to escape, I will receive you to myself right before the wrath comes, all right? So it doesn't matter if you're a married couple and the wife serves God, and the husband doesn't, when the, if the rapture happens at night and both of you guys are laying in bed, the wife will be taken, the husband will be left. You might be at work sitting next to somebody in the cubicle next to you, all of a sudden you look, they gone, <laughs> and you are like, what just happened, all right? Just because you're friends with the person next door <laughs> doesn't mean that you're going to. This is about a real and life-changing relationship, not religion. God wants to know do you know me and do I know you? So that word taken in the Greek, again, is paralambano. Now, why does that matter? That matters because, th th because this means re I'm going to receive you to myself. Jesus says, I'm going to receive you to myself, and this is wedding language. We are, do you want me to share this? Okay, I'm, I'm going to start this. I'm, I'm going to leave you hanging. I'm going to start, leave you hanging, and then you come back next week and hear the rest of this because this is really, really, really good. Jesus, a lot, a lot of times in his explanation of the rapture, uses wedding language for that day in the, in the Greek or in the Hebrew culture, all right? So when he says, I will receive you to myself, that is what a groom would say to his bride if they, if they were um, engaged. During the engagement period, what would happen is the groom would, he would propose to her, and then one year of engagement would transpire. And during that time, the groom would go, this is typical for Hebrew culture, the, the groom would go to his father's house where he grew up, and he would add on a room to his father's house. Okay, so he would spend that year building and adding on a room that he and his wife, when they get married at the end of that year, he will go, and this is the, this is the Hebrew term, he will receive her to himself and take her back to his father's house where he has prepared a room for her. Does this sound familiar to anybody? So this is wedding language. Jesus is saying in this passage, twice he says you're going to be, one, uh, one will be in bed and the other will be, say it, taken, all right, received unto myself. Uh, one will be grinding at the mill, the other will be taken. He uses wedding language saying I will come and receive you unto myself. Look at John 14 and verse 2. Jesus says this. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go now to, listen, prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will, what? Receive you. I will, paralambano, I will receive you to myself. I will take you unto myself because we, the church, are the bride of Christ. And he is the bridegroom. And he, before the wrath of God comes, like it did in the days of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and as it did in the days of Noah when the flood came, Jesus, the groom, is going to come back, and he is going to receive the bride of Christ unto himself because he has prepared a place for you. You can give God praise because he's done that for you. He's done that for you. And there's so much more to this. I think we're going to start next week's message with this. We are. So next week, we're going to answer the question, why does there have to be a rapture, all right? You do not want to miss. This was my favorite part of this whole message, and I have to cut my own part. So we're going to cut that second question out. You come back next week, and we'll answer it. But jump down. We're going to read Matthew 25 as we wrap this up today. Matthew 25. This is a parable that Jesus was talking about. In verse 1, it says this, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten 
bridesmaids, here we go again with this wedding language, who took their lamps and went to meet their bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. I want you to think about, are you ready? Which one of these are you? Listen to me. The five who were foolish did not take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. They got a little distracted. At midnight, they were aroused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids, they got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five who were foolish asked the others, please give me some of your oil for, for our lamps are going out. Verse 9, but the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy that for yourself. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready, say ready. Those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Today, the question is simply this. Are you ready? Jesus gave this parable as an example of the time when he came back and honestly, I can't say that this is verbatim, but when I read this, half of those who were in the church didn't make it. Five were wise. They were ready. They had extra oil. When he came, they were ready to go. The other five were left. And in the same way as in the days of Noah, see, in the days of Noah, Noah was preaching the entire time he was building the ark. He was preaching that rain is coming. But the wrath of God is coming. Get your life right. Repent of your sins. Obey God. And they kept laughing and partying and living their life for themselves, completely distracted, marrying, given in marriage, right up until the day that God said, it's over. Noah, you take your family. There were eight people. He said, Noah, you are a righteous man. You are in right position with me. You take your wife, your three sons, and their wives you load. And listen to me. Noah did not shut the door of the ark. God did. Because Noah could not have handled it. Because when they started screaming out in terror, as the rains begin to fall, and as the waters begin to rise, and they begin to start to drown, and they were screaming, Noah! We believe you now. Let us in, Noah. There was nothing he could do because God had shut that door. And God says to us today, I have warned my people. The Bible says that he will not return until every single person on the face of the earth has heard the message of Jesus and has had an opportunity to choose. You see, the incredible thing about God is he gives us something called a free will. He created humanity because he wanted a people to love and to be loved. But he says, I'm not going to make you love me. What kind of love is that? I want you to choose to willingly love me, to choose to willingly serve me, to realize that I've got a plan that's so incredible for your life. I've got plans that are good and not evil. I want to pour out my favor and my blessings over you, but you get to choose. Will you be ready? Will you be ready when I come back for my bride? The question today is not really, have you ever prayed a prayer of salvation? The question is, have you made Jesus Lord of your life? Because there's a really, really big difference. You can pray a prayer all you want, but if there's no life change attached to it, if you don't start thinking differently and talking differently and, and, and you, your motivations change and your life begins to change and, and you gear yourself more towards wanting to please God, a change probably really hasn't happened. That salvation probably hasn't taken root. Because the Bible says you'll know a tree by its fruit, all right? And so today, as your pastors, more than anything, we love that you're here in the house of God. We love that you're watching online. But that's not good enough. Because it's not about just going to church. It's about being the church. It's not just about praying prayers. It's about having a real relationship with God. God is asking you today, do you know me? Do you know me? Do you have a real and life-changing relationship with me? You know, fear is a really good thing. 
The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. We should be afraid because God is really, really big. And he has a lot of, 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 of judgment set aside for people who refuse to serve him and love him and accept his free gift of grace. It's not that he wants to pour out the wrath. He hates that. God hates that. Do you love disciplining your children? No, but it has to be done. We have to see discipline happen. God loves humanity, but we have to choose. As Misty said, free will. We have to choose whether or not we're going to serve him and live for him. So I hope that you've made that decision. I hope that you've made that decision to live for God and to have a real relationship with him. Let's bow our heads today, and I want to give you an opportunity if you have not to do that right now. In your heart, I just I want you to ask yourself, do I really know him? And there's nobody looking around right now. I'm not going to call anybody forward, but I want to know who I'm praying with today, who I'm agreeing with. If you're in this house and you say, I, I am not where I need to be with God, and I, I want to make it right right now. I want to be rapture ready. And you're ready to pray this prayer with me. Just simply raise your hand so I can see who you are. Would you raise your hand in this place today, please? Thank you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand in the back. I see the other hand. Thank you. Anybody else today? Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. Those watching online, I see your hand over here to the right. If you're watching online today, I want you to type in the comment section below. I'm all in. All right? And we're going to pray this prayer together right now. This is not going to be just a prayer. This is going to be a life change that takes root deep in our hearts. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I confess Him as Lord of my life. Help me to be ready for your soon coming return. In Jesus' name.